Hello, welcome to my podcast, Yorkshire Property Partners. In the show, we will be discussing the latest news and trends in the property market in the Yorkshire area. I'm Fiona Conway, Director of Fiona Conway and Associates Mortgage Brokers, and I am your host. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Marcus Wehrmal. He is a structural surveyor, director of local firm Progress Consulting, and also the National Network Claims Tech. Hi, Marcus. Hi, Fiona. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's a pleasure. Are you okay today? Yeah, I haven't seen you since our little Christmas lunch. <laughs> oh, I do enjoy our little meetings. It's, it's, it is nice, isn't it? Just to just just have a chat with other people in, in the industry, really, and uh, have, a, have a little question. glass of wine. <laughs> yeah, too. But December's the best month. Everyone's much more relaxed and everything seems like it's coming to an end and well, well, it, it winds down a bit, doesn't it? But Christmas, thankfully, so it gives us a chance just to get out and do our bit of networking and, uh, you know, just, just seeing each other because I refer business to you all year long, but barely get a chance to say hi to you. So it's really nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, I graduated with a degree in building surveying many years ago, probably 2000. Um, since then, I worked for 10 years in the insurance industry, mainly working on subsidence of buildings and structural defects of buildings, fires and floods, cars going into houses. Uh, in 2010, I started Progress Consulting and started to work locally, looking at crack damaged buildings and spread out across the country. As a result of that, we started Claims Tech, which is a national network of surveyors and engineers. And we specialize mainly in crack damage to buildings and other structural defects to buildings in the insurance industry. Uh, we've been relatively successful over the last eight years and uh, it's got to the point where we are looking at possibly getting some more members of the network to cover all the work that's coming in. And Progress Consulting is a relatively small firm and that's just work locally on uh, house buyers and structural problems that we have around Harrogate area. Gosh, busy man, busy man, you've got lots going on. Indeed. <laughs> so I suppose the theme of this series really is um, talking about how things have changed since COVID came into our lives. Um, I've noticed um, with my clients that not all of them are looking to move. Um, there's the, the property market's crazy right now. We have not many properties for sale and a lot of buyers potentially bidding on each property. So people yeah. are considering, okay, what are our other options? Maybe we can stay where we are, renovate our home, extend. So if I want to do that, Marcus, what are the things that I should consider before I start making major changes to my property? Uh, yeah, it's a good question because we have I've seen horror stories. We've seen people start building extensions without telling the neighbor and undermining the foundations. We've seen contractors walk off halfway through, oh. um, not design the foundations correctly. So there are a lot of things to think about when you about to do something which could potentially be one of the biggest outlays you make in your life. Mm. Uh, so I think the first thing to always do is know what you want. Because okay. if you don't know what you want, you don't know how much it's going to cost. You don't know what it's going to look like at the end. And you might be surprised and happy, but you might also be disappointed. Mm -hmm. So you should always know what you want in your mind. And if you don't, you need professional advice. Uh, and I think the that can sometimes be an architect or a builder. And when you're doing a survey of a house, you can often tell whether it's an architect or a builder who designed it. That's no disrespect to the builders, but the architect designed extensions seem to be a, a little bit more planned out than the flow of the rooms, et cetera, and the design. Um, but if it's a simple extension, you don't need a, an architect for that. Yeah. Um, the second thing to do is once you've found what you want to do and you've had that designed and you're choosing a contractor is to make do your due diligence on the contractor. Um, that would be online, but more crucial evidence is past work. So you can ask the contractor for details of people whose houses they've worked on before and who've had extensions done. 
And that's the easiest thing to do. You can just call them up and make sure that the, everything went well. Uh, but one of the other good ways to choose a builder is by uh, personal recommendation, which is yeah. similar to what we do with our yeah. network in the, in, in the business. Personal recommendation takes away a lot of that due diligence because you, you can already know that the, the builder's done a good job. Um, so that's that's looking at it from selecting a builder. Um, do you have any good builders that you work with locally? Wow, yes, absolutely. I mean, um, one of the um, podcasts that, um, well, the first episode actually was with um, Paul Heap from Mallard Homes. Um, yeah. He was talking to us about um, what he does and what he will be doing in the future as well about sustainable living, which um, yeah. was really interesting, really, really interesting. So, um, yeah, that's definitely someone who... Um, who I would go to with, without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, so, I think that energy efficiency, sorry. energy efficiency in houses is is at the forefront of all our minds because of the rise in gas prices. And yeah. if there was a simple way of of uh, improving all the housing stock, we'd we'd be doing it. But I think people have got to really concentrate on making sure loft insulation is in place, double glazing, perhaps a uh, good boiler, uh, draft mm -hmm. excluders, that kind of thing. If you've got cavity walls, make sure they've got cavity wall insulation. Um, but there's no easy way, way of um, reducing that energy bill, unfortunately. No, I think that's the problem, isn't it? And, you know, not only are energy prices rising, but we are at home more. So it's costing us more anyway, um, yeah. you know, to pay for these bills. So it's definitely something that um, people do have in their minds and lenders have in their mind as well. You know, they are, yeah. some lenders are offering um cash back and, and slightly preferential rates for green homes so you know that meet a certain energy efficiency um rating so um i think it's something that everybody's looking at right now so uh, yeah, pretty popular on the so, building side um yeah the, the other thing to do once you've picked your contractor mm -hmm. is to consider employing a project manager or contract administrator yeah. especially if it's a larger project because a, con a lot of extensions don't have a contract and you, you're kind of um, at risk there of, of losing money or something going wrong or delays happening. Uh, so having a contract administrator on your side would stop a lot of those problems. And one big thing that happens with extensions is finishing off, which is always a builder's nightmare anyway, but trying to get the job completely finished and snagged. And that's where your contract administration comes in because you can retain payments and, and uh, make sure that, that work's fully done uh, and also keep money back for a year so the latent defects are looked after. Um, so if you can, a, a project manager or contract administrator would be ideal for medium to large extensions. That's good advice. Thank you very much. Um, so what if i do decide to move home then and i've got lots of viewings booked in lots of properties to go and see um, we'll be in this market. <laughs> hypothetically <Yeah. laughs> what should i be looking for externally and internally when i'm going to view a property are there any things that i should be looking for and thinking hmm, i need to get that checked yeah, definitely. Uh, although I wouldn't mention that to the estate agent, particularly in the current market, because you'll be on the bottom of their list if you. <laughs> so if you're viewing it with an estate agent, never say anything. Just nod. And, uh, <laughs> put that to the next, the end of the pile. But uh, if you're looking at a house, the first thing I would be looking for is the roof line. So pitched roof um, with a gable or hip end to make sure that you can see. And the eye is a really good tool to, to check on whether something's level or not. Mm -hmm. um, and the type of roof it is, we've got a lot of old slate roofs in Harrogate that probably reach the end of the life. And that depending on the size of the house could cost you thousands to replace. So yeah. the roof inside and out would be the first port of call. Mm -hmm. I think then you're looking at walls, whether you can see cracks in the walls and can you see any distortions, any bulges. Um, and that's where we come in a lot of the time with uh, yeah. crack damage to buildings. And surprisingly, properties can be marketed, they can be viewed, and they can be looked at by valuation surveyors. 
And then right at the end of the process, the crack that's been there all along will stop the sale and we'll have to go and look at it and, and find out what's going on with it. Um, yeah. So if you can see the crack at, right at the start, then it'd be good to just have that looked at. No, I agree with you. I think we're finding a lot that, you know, when surveys are being done, if there are any issues that crop up on those surveys, um, which are important for the buyers to know, um, it can cause problems later on down the line. So in Scotland, they actually do things a bit differently to how they do them in this country, in England. So in Scotland, as you know, um, the seller has to provide a home report. So anyone who views that property will have a good indication of the condition of the property straight away. What do you think of that? Do you think it's something that we should adopt in, in England? Well, we've tried to do that quite a few times and mm. for various different reasons it's failed. Um, I think there's a trust issue with spending the biggest spend that you're going to do in your entire life, which is a house, mm. uh, and basing it on someone else's information that you haven't employed. And yeah. I think there's a, there's a slight issue there in our, our psyche in this country that we, we don't really like to do that. Um, even on new build houses, we occasionally get asked to do full surveys, even though the house has literally just been built. Mm -hmm. um, and of course it'll have snags, but it won't really have any structural problems unless the builders did something drastically wrong. Yeah. So there's a trust issue there. And, and also if the seller did construct a survey um, and they found lots of problems in the house, that they wanted to rectify prior to putting it onto the market, would they then pay the surveyor to come back out and have a look and alter the report? Mm. Um, if the sale takes a year, will we come out and do another report? It, it's, it would need to be clarified, but I think in, in, uh, in general terms, it's, it's probably a good idea. Yeah. So a good idea, but there are some areas that really, do need discussing before we adopt something like that in England. <laughs> yeah, there was the whole um, uh, uh, industry tried to form, I think it was about 10 years ago, it might even be longer, called a home survey pack. Do you remember? Yes, I do. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I don't know how much the government spent on, on promoting that and, um, and getting all the infrastructure in place, but at the end of the day, it didn't happen. So. <laughs> You know, for us to change the way that we buy and sell houses would, would take a lot. And I don't think we've got the uh, energy in the, the country to, uh, or the impetus to do that sort of uh, sea change. It's interesting to get your point of view on that because um, like you say, in general terms, it seems like a no brainer. It seems like something we should have been doing for years. Um, mm. But like, you know, there are lots of points that do need to be raised before we can do something like that in, in England. So it would help you, I, I suppose, as a mortgage. Oh, I think it does, yeah, because um, you know, we as a mortgage broker, I think, oh, everything's going nicely, you know, we're we're, we're nearly like we're getting to a mortgage offer, that's fantastic. And then the buyer will get, you know, the um the home buyer's report and something comes up on that. It does yeah. then um cause some negotiation in some cases. But what I really like about your reports which are different some I've seen in the past, is that it is quite clear about what is urgent, what needs doing right away, and really what could wait. You know, you can move in and do that when you're ready. Because we don't know. As you know, general person, we don't know what's important and what isn't, what's urgent and what isn't. We're looking to you to give us that advice. And that's what I like about the reports that I see from you. You know, it is quite clear what should be done now, what is going to cause you a problem and what you can look at later on down the line once you've moved in and you've got a bit of money together. Yeah, a, a good survey should be like a manual for your house mm. and especially on an older house where you do have to do maintenance on the house. There's no, there's no two ways about it, especially when you've got an older roof covering. But depending on what maintenance you do will depend on what you have to spend later down the line. Most Commercial property owners know that if you if you have planned maintenance to a building, then it will save you on reactive maintenance and full scale replacement in the long run. So it is a, is it a question of, of managing your building and, and that's what a good survey report should should do for you. Yeah, no, I agree. So, like I say, I've seen I've seen I've seen your reports. Um, I've been recommending that my clients use you since I started my business. 
um, and I'd just like you, if you don't mind, just to go through the different reports that you do offer and why each report would be suitable for which type of property. Okay, so uh, on the RICS reports, there's level one, two, three. Mm -hmm. The level one is a, a condition report, and I, I don't know whether anyone's asked you for a condition report in the past, but we yeah. rarely, rarely get asked for a condition report. It, it's the same format as the home buyer survey, but it doesn't have any um, real recommendations on it. It's, it's literally just a monkey see, monkey do report. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you're copying down what you can see, but you're not really commenting that much on it. Mm. Um, so I don't really think they're that useful, to be honest. No. The second report is the home buyer report, which is probably the one that everybody has heard of and everybody groans when they hear about it because <laughs> well i know a lot of the perception of a home buyer report is that a surveyor is just covering his back which is you have a roof get a roof inspection <laughs> get an engineer have electrics get an electric <laughs> yes there's no actual uh, there's no actual engineering or, or surveying input into those reports other than covering your back you know this house may have asbestos and you know that what yeah. does that so I think home buyer reports can sometimes be useful for a simple structure. So a relatively modern house that maybe it's just suffering from a bit of wear and tear. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'll, you'll maybe need to replace the boiler in the kitchen, um, bathroom suite, things like that. So, but otherwise it hasn't been touched structurally. There's no extensions or anything like that on it. Yeah. Uh, so the, the more uh, common report is the building survey, which is for l larger or level three survey is for larger properties, more complex with extensions and walls removed, um, maybe with solid wall construction or stone wall construction. Uh, and they can, hopefully they will provide the in-depth information that you need that we were talking about earlier. To, mm -hmm. It's like a manual for your house. Yeah. Uh, so that hopefully will look at the defects, analyze those defects, tell you what you need to do about those defects. And only in the the, the most um, unusual of circumstances should we really be recommending further investigations. So recommending further investigations just because you don't know what's there is, is not the same as recommending further investigations because you've seen evidence of damage and you can see a trail and you're not sure so that you need to have a look at it. But I think a lot of surveyors take that opportunity to um, say you've got suspended timber floor, I can't see the floor, you need a floor inspection. Yeah. We, yeah. Get a lot, we get a lot of work from surveys that come out where there's a, a, a crack because there's no lintel or mm. it's just a crack. Uh, and, and that's really good for us because we get to go out and, and just confirm that there's no problem, but not so good for the seller or the buyer um, as it slows the process down and you have to pay twice for a survey. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. And I think that is one problem that, you know, buyers are having, they are looking at some reports and saying, well, I don't know what needs doing, I can't check everything, that's going to cost me a fortune. And I might not even be buying this house, <laughs> you know, yeah. so um, I think mm -hmm. to have a report that does give some indication of what surgeon, you know, what is a big job, what isn't a big job. It, it, it's it's just so helpful it's so helpful and it's very helpful for me as well <laughs> definitely yeah i mean I <laughs> when i when i try to deal with it as well yeah i can imagine i, I yeah. think if the agents or even if uh, mortgage advisors could could say earlier in the stage to sellers that if you're selling a house get an electrical survey report because mm. why would you want to buy a house without a valid up-to-date electrical survey or, or same with gas and the boiler some people do have all that. When I arrive at a house, there's a full package of information, which is really good. Yeah. But others, you go to a house which is empty and decaying and, and it's got no information at all. And you know that people are going to have to do this. And we knew that right at the start of the sale process. So mm -hmm. it would be good if that was introduced a bit more early. Yeah, well, it's what landlords need, isn't it? Um, you know, landlords yeah. need these certificates um to ensure that the properties that they're renting out are are safe and of a good standard um yeah. so i think it makes sense to do something like that um you, you're one step ahead then and at, at the moment 
the process of buying a house does seem to take a little bit longer. Um, you know, there are delays still due to COVID. And um, I think to get all that information as soon as you possibly can, so you don't have to then apply for it later on down the line, is, is a really good idea. It's just a more seamless process, really. Yeah, removing the friction from process is, is one of the key things in business, isn't it? So if we can do yeah. that in the home buying industry, then it's a winner for everybody. Absolutely. The, well, the fourth thing I do is the one that's for uh, people who are maybe in the property industry or they're buying a house that needs to be refurbished. They know it needs to be refurbished. Um, okay. Called the headline report, where we just look at the big ticket items. So we, we wouldn't look at the kitchen and say, you need a new kitchen. We wouldn't mm -hmm. open windows. We, we presume that the, the buyer is savvy enough to have opened the doors and windows mm. um, and check the kitchen and the bathroom and the, presumably they're going to either keep them or remove them. The headline report is more to look at the structure of the building. So we look at the roof, covering the roof structure, the walls, um, damp. You know, when you go inside a, a house which has got damp, you can taste it before you can smell it or see it. And then you've yeah. got damp to confirm mm. it. Mm -hmm. But most of the time you can see there's damp for a reason. It's not because it, the property wasn't built without a damp proof course because they've been there for a hundred years without a damp proof course. Yeah. So there's usually a, a, a secondary uh, cause at play. Uh, so we look damp's, at this. Quite, damp's quite a scary word, isn't it? You know, people say, oh, the house has got damp and it's, it seems like it could be a huge issue, but in some cases, yeah. It's not as big an issue as people think. Yeah, I mean, sometimes with uh, buildings, there can be a raised ground level or leaking yeah. drain yeah. pipe or render is, is is causing a thermal bridge across the damp proof course. So there, there's usually a, a cause. And with older buildings, it seems to be that the lime mortar has been removed between the bricks or the stones and replaced with sun cement, which is forcing, is preventing the, the, the moisture in the in the wall from evaporating through the pointing. Uh, and that can cause internal damp as well. So yeah, there, there are other reasons for it rather than just saying, oh, you've got rising damp, you need to take off all your plaster or put a damp. Render. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then we'd look at the, uh, the floors and the, make sure they're all level. You've got good ventilation beneath the suspended timber floor. Mm -hmm. um, and then look for any other defects in the house that are relevant to the structure. So a headline report is is based around a house which is going to be fully refurbished or um, already has been refurbished. You just want to double check the, the main structure. Now that's really interesting because I think, like you said, home buyers report is probably the most popular one. Um, yeah. People have heard of like a full building survey, but the other... Yeah. Yeah. The other types I don't think are popular and it's not something that people would consider. Um, so it's really interesting just to have an overview of, you know, what, what you can offer clients. I think the best thing to do is speak to the surveyor and, and see what they think about the house. We always do a desktop on every house. So we, we know what it looks like. We know where it is, what the ground conditions should be in that area, um, what trees are around that area, how many extensions there are where there's radon gas. So we already know that information before we even go to the house. So oh, it's right. it's often easy to speak to the surveyor and say, what do you think, which report should we get? I didn't know you did all that information before or, or that research before you went out. That's good to know. Yeah, yeah, well, you, you need to know what you're looking at because sometimes uh, you might have a hidden, hidden valley, for example, and um, we've got drones that can go up and take some pictures up on the high level so that we can and see if there's any defects up there. Fantastic. That's uh, yeah. that's technology at the you know forefront, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it sometimes feels like Batman with all the uh, <laughs> gadgets I've got to try and do a survey. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds um, it sounds very technical. Um, I'll stick to mortgages. I'll leave you to be yeah. the expert in the well, surveying. I think. I think. <laughs> <clears throat> we also do a specific defect report which usually comes when someone approaches us directly about a, an issue with a house, or it comes off the back of one of those surveys, a <clears throat> home buyer report or a building survey, where the surveyor who's been 
is a bit unsure about what the cause of damage is. So right. in that case, it's such as cracking. Cracking is probably the big one. Damp, probably second. Um, asbestos, maybe third. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in order, the, the, the cracking, what we look for generally is a pattern of damage. So I don't just want to see one crack in the house and think the foundations have failed because foundation yeah, failure is relatively rare, especially in the north. Um, it's good to hear. So, yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> but it does happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've, you've got to look for a pattern of damage. So I want to see kind of a corner of the building's gone or the extension's moved or, or, or some mechanism that's caused uh, the movement to, to occur. Um, and then we want to see that cracking inside and outside because if the foundations failed, then the walls have moved both internally and externally. It just won't just be on one side. So if all the cracking's on the outside, for example, and there's absolutely no damage inside or distortion, then there's probably something else going on in the cavity. You've probably heard of cavity tray failure, that cavity wall yes. type failure. Yes, yes, yes. Seen a few of those, a few of those, yeah. 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 Have to get special yeah. supports for those then. Um. Yeah, exactly. Because mm. that that's uh, a different type of cracking, a more horizontal. Um, right. Cracking at high level, which which would indicate maybe that some roof spreads occurred. You know, has the roof structure been altered? Um, or is there a lack of lateral restraint there? So uh, the specific defect report would look at that crack damaged area and, and give an overview. I think if you do have a crack in your house and you want to sell it, the first port of call should be your insurance company. Because right. that's free. They'll send someone out to have a look at it and say mm -hmm. either yes or no. Presumably we know they might not help you with what it actually is or what's caused it. Um, but they, they might just say it's just not subsidence and move on. Um, so the, the damp we, we touched on earlier where uh, higher damp readings in an old house are pretty much expected unless it's been fully gutted mm. and all the plaster has been taken off the walls and um, it's been had a, some sort of slurry mix or um, a, a membrane put onto the uh, to the walls to stop that damp. So in general, if you see damp in a building, there's usually a, a reason for that other than the nature of its construction. So you have to track that back and try and trace what's going on in the building. Yeah. Um, and there can be a, quite a lot of causes with that, as you can imagine. No, I can imagine. And, you know, like, like we said earlier, you know, it, it's not always extremely serious. You know, there are, um, you know, there are some, there is sometimes quite an easy fix for it. I, I looked at a house that was built in the 14th century up in mm. uh, North Yorkshire somewhere. And it will always have a degree of damp problem. Yeah. As you need to let the walls breathe. Yes, yes. Um, so the other thing that we get asked about a lot is asbestos. Mm. Again, it's a scary word. Damp, yeah. subsidence, asbestos. Those are the three things you don't want to see on a survey, aren't they? Yeah, you start then considering your house, don't you? And <laughs> when you hear yeah. asbestos. Well, the thing about asbestos is it, th there are three main types in in our building materials. There's blue, brown, and white, mm -hmm. which is chrysalidite, amosite, and chrysotile, if you want to be technical. <laughs> um, and the blue and brown asbestos are, are like javelins, and that's what causes um, the harmful effects to lungs when those javelins get stuck in the, in the lungs. And the, the chrysotile, the white asbestos, is more like hair. And that was used in things like Artex to thicken the mix up. Okay. But all asbestos is banned. Mm. But white asbestos, the chrysotile, was only banned in 98 or 99. And even after that, the existing stock of chrysotile materials were used. So anything below 2000, which has Artex, for example, or thermoplastic floor tiles, then there's a mm -hmm. possibility it could be asbestos containing. But don't worry about it because it's a really low risk product um, okay. and if it's, if it's in good condition there's nothing to worry about um, it's just if you're going to take a ceiling down or you want to do some work in the in the house taking walls out etc that it's best to get a test and we can do that easily with uh, um, the asbestos 
gets sampled, gets sent to a lab, and it's dissolved in acid. The material's dissolved in acid, and the only thing that can survive that acid is asbestos, because it was a, an amazing material, which is why it was used so much. So That's any house, any house between the Second World War and 2000 could potentially have asbestos, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's it's harmful to your health. In fact, in the vast majority of cases, it's not. Well, that's really useful information because, like you say, you know, it's one of those buzzwords that do make people very nervous when they're buying a house um, or even probably selling a house. Um, so um, it, it's it's good to know. It's good to have these little snippets of information for people. Yeah, well, I've got lots. Where should we go? <laughs> I know you do. I know you do. We could talk <laughs> for hours. <laughs> We'll leave that for our next lunch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So obviously people will want to know more about you um, uh, today, Marcus. So where can they find out more information about you and particularly Progress Consulting? I, I said, if you Google me, you'll probably find information on Amazon about books that I've written, but they're not to do with uh, building related matters. They're more post-apocalyptic adventure <laughs> stories. Okay. Um, for Progress Consulting, uh, the best place to go is the website. Um, it's got some information on there, but we don't want to overload people with um, information. If you want to talk about any any issue, then just give the office a call and we'll, we'll do our best to help you. That's lovely. Well, thanks very much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure to speak to you and you've given, so, given us so much information. Thank you very much for that, Marcus. Thanks for having me, Fiona. Great, no problem. Hopefully see you on the next series. See you later. Okay, bye. Bye.